Google, and a couple of years later, then she moved to U to the U Munich, to where she's currently as a, a senior scientist working with uh, working in the group of Johannes Lercher. And today she will talk about metal oxide for oxidation catalysis. Please. Uh, what is the motivation 
we can study this uh, multi uh, mix oxide catalysts. Um, these are very good catalysts for the uh, ethane oxidative dehydrogenation that, as you know, um, aims to, to compete with the well established um, uh, steam cracker technology for production of ethylene. Uh, it has the advantage that it can be performed at much lower temperatures and at, uh, um, also in small uh, scale in comparison to the largest steam crackers. And the high activity and selectivity of this uh, MOFTE catalyst has put this process uh, very close to uh, commercial application. Therefore, there's an interest in, in understanding better this, this material. But there is another important uh, advantage. And it's that uh, even though it is a quite complex material, as you can imagine, we have four different metals in a mix of size. It is, uh, however, uh, well defined because we know that the activity uh, in alkane activation is only related to the presence of a particular crystalline uh, phase, which is the M phase. Um, so here you can see a correlation, a correlation between the ODH uh, rates and the content of M1 phase in different uh, materials, meaning that any other possible binary alternary metal oxide combinations that we can form will not be able to activate alkane at the temperatures that we are working with. And this is a, a good uh, starting point. Uh, the active side is uh, still under debate, but at least we know the crystalline structure that contains the active side. Um, in order to um, compete with the steam uh, cracking process for ethical production, we need to uh, uh, keep high selectivities at uh, conversions above 60%. So there are some improvements that we need to do in this material, uh, in particular uh, regarding uh, the activity. Um, here I show you several strategies to increase the activity. Um, the first uh, one is um, quite straightforward. Since the M1 phase is the active uh, material, we have to try to, uh, to have high purity in M1 and to have synthesis method that avoid the precipitation of other uh, metal oxides. We have also uh, a bulk catalyst for the surface areas are relatively small, so ideally we would like to increase the surface area. And the third strategy, um, which is what I'm going to talk about today, more interestingly, we can try to increase the intrinsic activity of the M1 phase, and with this I mean that we increase the, co the concentration of active sites within the crystalline structure. Um, in order to explain you how to, how to do that, I have to introduce you a little bit to the M1 phase um, crystalline structure. It's shown here the AB plane. Um, it is, uh, as you see, a complex pattern formed by mostly uh, metal oxide of the hydra that are uh, interconnected by sharing one oxygen corner. And then this um, uh, material would grow uh, three dimensionally in this axis perpendicular to the screen, just repeating layer by layer the, um, this pattern um, and sharing one oxygen corner with the next uh, layer. Um, we have um, this metal oxide of hydra that are uh, occupied by either molybdenum and vanadium, uh, although the molybdenum is the most abundant metal, and this uh, both molybdenum and vanadium can be in different uh, oxidation states. So we have uh, quite a chemical flexibility already. In principle, the M1 phase can be formed with only molybdenum and vanadium. But um, as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, is the composition, is the formulation with tellurium and iodine the, uh, the best catalyst. And therefore, this is the material in which we focus. Uh, for the most formulation, we have the tellurium in, uh, located in this hexagonal and hexagonal channels that are formed. Uh, by the octaedra, um, but I have to mention that these channels are usually partially occupied only by these tellurium oxide chains. So not every unit cell will contain tellurium oxide. Um, finally, the niobium is located in these pentagonal uh, units, but at the center, so these pentagonal pyramids are surrounded by five uh, metal oxide octaedra, uh, forming sort of a pentagonal uh, 
flower. Um, what uh, um, you need to keep in mind is that this building block is also uh, found in other molybdenum oxides that are uh, um, inactive for this reaction. And it is well known that this uh, is not the active side. Um, Okay, so what is the active side? Well, the activity is attributed to vanadine species, uh, located in, in the M1, uh, that are uh, forming this oxygen radical species that are able to abstract the first hydrogen from the alkene. And then, because of the uh, uh, unique performance of M1, it is uh, yeah, believe that the active sites are in, in, in features that are unique for the M1 phase, uh, such as the uh, this five uh, metal oxide of hydra. Um, so the acids have been vanilla species located in one or more of these five of hydra. And this is our uh, working hypothesis here. So they are marked in, in red and green in the skin. Although also I have to mention that the seven member green channels has been also proposed as, uh, as the origin for the special activity and selectivity of this um, The active sites will be nevertheless classically distributed, so we don't have, we have um, meta positions in which potentially we might have active sites, but of course it will depend uh, of a uh, combination of molybdenum and vanadium and oxidation states, so but the occupancy is important. Um, we probably uh, have to separate the active sites in order to preserve the selectivity, and uh, um, here I have tilted the, the the structure so that you can see um, the active sites have to be, of course, accessible to the gas phase, meaning that if we cut the crystal in this way, for instance, we could have along the C axis uh, rows of possible active uh, positions, uh, as you can see here with the red and the green. Okay, okay to, to sum up, the intrinsic activity of M1 uh, depends on metal occupancy and surface location of the site. So we could uh, try to change these two parameters in order to increase this intrinsic activity. Um, these are the two approaches uh, that we have. Um, first, in the first part, I'm going to talk about uh, how tuning the metal composition um, can create additional sites. Uh, we have studied the one to increase the vanadium content, that's In the crystalline structure, we have more uh, chances to put the vanadium in the right positions. And um, also, um, we'll discuss the promoting effect of tellurium, which has been found to be necessary for reaching high activities. In the second part, I'm going to talk about uh, how controlling the morphology and crystal determination of M1 particles can also increase the intrinsic activity. So regarding uh, the metal stoichiometry, we prepare a series of catalysts with high content of high purity in M1 phase, and we change the, um, in the here in this first graph that I'm showing you, we change the vanadium content, and we kept constant the other um, elements in the in the composition, and we can see here in the arrhenium the arrhenius plots uh, that the catalyst behave the same in the sense that we have parallel lines, so same energy of activation, same nature of the active size, but we have a shift towards higher rates when we increase the vanadium content. So this is more or less what we expected. And now that we have optimized the vanadium content, we change, we keep the vanadium moly uh, radio at zero 30, and we change the tellurium and niobium content. So here you can see that we can do, we can prepare a molybdenum vanadium uh, catalyst without any tellurium and niobium, uh, but the activity is lower. And then when we have tellurium and niobium, it increases. Indeed, it looks like the niobium content doesn't have an effect, but the tellurium, if we have a ratio of tellurium molybdenum of 0.05, we reach the highest activity. And when we increase it to 0.10, then the activity goes down. So we wanted to understand this effect of the tellurium um, before showing you what we think is the reason for uh, this promoting effect. Um, a little bit more, we have another observation of these catalysts when we studied them under differential conditions, so a conversion of about 5%. Um, 
we observe that uh, there is an in situ activation in the first hours uh, time on the street. Uh, we also observe that this in situ activation, uh, the extent of it changes with the uh, gas composition. So here uh, I'm plotting the activity normalized to the initial activity. So we start in both cases at 100%, and we have two curves with the same catalyst in which we have changed the the uh, gas mixture, so the reverse potential of the gas phase has changed, and we see that the, uh, the activation increases in between 10 and 15 percent in this first hour. So it seems that the material has a response to the, to the reaction conditions, and um, um, we wanted to understand that, the, which changes are uh, happening in the M1 particles during these first hours. And that was the reason we uh, used environmental STM. So here we have different images of one particle, uh, particle of M1, in which uh, so we have uh, subjected this uh, uh, sample to 0 0.9 eva of an ODH mixture, and we look at the particle uh, before heating after five minutes at 400 degrees in ODH, and then after 10 minutes, and then after 70 minutes. Um, uh, we were expecting to see some changes in the surface, given this in situ activation, but what we see is actually it looks it's pretty robust. So we could, uh, with this technique, we can uh, see atomically the, the composition of the surface of the, of the particle, and we could not see any restructuring of the surface or any uh, dramatic changes of the uh, geometry of the surface. Um, indeed, the only change we observed, we have to go to high magnification, um, which is anyway nice to see. Uh, I think uh, you can recognize the M1 pattern here in this uh, high magnification images. The easiest feature to spot is the hexagonal channel that appears as a uh, dark uh, circle because uh, it is empty in this material, while the hexagonal channel has a bright dot in the center, meaning that it has a beautiful lead. So I'm marking here is uh, two hexagonal channels that are surrounded this uh, red and green octahedra of the active side. Um, what we can see is that with increasing time and uh, uh, this um, ODH mixture in the environmental STM, the, uh, the intensity of this bright spot in the hexagonal channels is uh, decreasing and at the end is almost disappearing. So we tested this uh, this phenomenon for different uh, particles. We see that the <coughs> relative intensity of the tellurium in this position decreases with time under this uh, ODH uh, uh, mixture, uh, regardless of the thickness of the particle. And we also tested under different gas composition. For instance, under uh, oxygen, this uh, tellurium uh, intensity decrease was uh, less pronounced. Uh, while in all the eggs that we are in a slightly reducing conditions, uh, this is, is more important. Um, but then, uh, we, with the help of theory, we want to see what is happening with the material when we lose tellurium. Um, first of all, the calculations about uh, the, lo the lowest energy of formation of an oxygen vacancy agrees well. Uh, so, because According to theory, this would be in the tellurium oxygen uh, chains in the hexagonal channel. Um, so when we have the material under reducing conditions, so this is the case of the presence of an alkane, this uh, would be the, the first oxygen to be removed. And in this process, we are generating tellurium, uh, uh, we are reducing tellurium 4 to tellurium 2 plus, it is very unstable, and then it takes two electrons from the structure, and it would uh, leave the material as metallic. And by taking these two electrons, it's generating uh, here and here in this region oxygen uh, are two O minor, R minus species. Um, we can also calculate how the uh, charges of molybdenum, vanadium, and oxygen change with this uh, emission of tellurium oxide from the channels. And we see a shift that is equivalent to increasing the vanadium content in the crystalline structure. So what we propose, oh well, by the way, this uh, bridging oxygen, uh, it is in the, the 
because the delirium uh, in the hexagonal channels is adjacent to this uh, active site, so it happens to be also in this uh, position where the vanadium is located. Um, what we propose then is that um, this O minus bridging species are performing as well the, the, uh, the reaction. So it is not that these type of species are able to abstract the first hydrogen of alkanes. Um, so in this way here we show how the F and ODH will happen in these sites. Uh, at the end we generate an oxygen vacancy that can be restored by the oxygen of the gas phase. Um, uh, what I would like to emphasize is that um, in order to have this um, multiple turnovers in this part, we only depend on the lifetime of this O minus uh, radical species. We don't need to emit a delirium unit every time that we want to activate a molecule of F. So we expose this material under reducing conditions. Some of the delirium, not on all of it, some of the delirium uh, uh, leaves the material. And by doing that, we generate additional sites that can perform the reaction. So, because these uh, observations in, in environmental STM happen at the same kind of scale as, um, as these changes that we have observed, uh, this in situ activation in the first hours, we attribute uh, this additional activity that we gain in the first hours under reaction to these additional sites, uh, together with the vanilla species, are, um, are on the surface of our material. So to sum up on this part, we have seen how the catalyst adjust dynamically to the operating conditions. And then on the second part, we are going to discuss how um, we can uh, change the morphology and the crystal definition in order to increase our activity. Um, I'll show you here, it is known that the morphology of M1 particles affect activity. Um, I will show you here uh, these two cases where we have uh, on the left particles that are more like rods and on the right uh, particles that are a little bit more like uh, flattened. Um, and the ones on the left are belong to an M1 sample that is much more active than the other one on the right. Um, and in both cases, so M1 particles tend to grow along the C axis. So I'll show you here what is the AV plane that we have been looking at. So this well-defined plane is actually only a minor fraction of the surface area of the particles. So if the morphology is affecting so much the activity, it means that the lateral facets have activity and it's, this is uh, very relevant for the, for the overall activity of the particles. Um, therefore, we need to uh, um, study and understand how the termination the lateral termination of the crystals uh, look like. Uh, this is what we did uh, um, a few years ago. Um, we, did, uh, uh, we quantified the, statistically, the, the statistical distribution of the lateral facets of these particles. Um, and we, in this way, found there are three lateral terminations that are the most abundant, uh, that, that are marked here in different colors. Uh, by far, the most frequent lateral termination was this 0, 1, 0 marked in yellow. Um, if we look closely to this 0, 1, 0 facet, we can see that it's uh, just um, um, a zigzag chain of these pentagonal flowers interconnected by one single octahedron. So if you remember, these pentagonal channels are not active at all. And if we extend this 0, 1, 0 uh, facet, there is no chance for an uh, active site to be exposed. Um, so we can, well, we can assume this uh, 0, 1, 0 passes are completely inactive. Um, luckily, we have also two other facets in the lateral termination, which are 1, 2, 0, and 2, 1, 0. And uh, here, you can see that indeed, these facets, they expose some of the uh, positions that are potentially active. Um, uh, what we uh, found also is that we can correlate high activity to samples in which uh, there is a higher uh, frequency of this 1 to 0 and 2 1 0 lateral facet. While uh, those samples with morphologies that were the 0 1 0 was more, more predominant were less active. So 
with this knowledge, it makes sense trying to find a method in which we can form particles when we avoid this 0, 1, 0 inactive fashion. Um, so our starting point is the hydrothermal synthesis, that is uh, one of the most scalable uh, synthesis methods for M1. And just to show you how it is, it is done, we have uh, um, the metal soluble salts that we put in an autoclave under hydrothermal conditions for about 48 hours. And in these um, conditions, we form an intermediate, this large ions are in solution, and these are known to be the necessary intermediate to form in. Um, under this, uh, this method, we have a precipitation of an amorphous precursor, and then we need to activate this precursor at high temperatures, about 600, 650 degrees, in order to generate the crystalline In this way, we have uh, materials that they have 5 to 15 per meters per gram, and particles that they very often present uh, extended 0, 1, 0 inactive facets. So we see there is room for improvement for the synthesis method. We want to um, um, make some modification of, of this hydrothermal synthesis. Um, we need, to, of course, to maintain the M1 phase purity. Uh, we wanted to increase the surface area as possible. You see this rather low. Um, another requirement, uh, since we want this method to be a scalable for a, for a commercial application, we want to substitute metal salts, because some of them are sparse and quite expensive, by more available metal oxides. So, um, metal oxides are not very soluble in water, but we have the hydrothermal effect, so we them in the outer plate and we analyze the liquid phase um, in the first hours of the synthesis. Here I'm showing you the metal concentration in the liquid phase. We see there's a small amount of metals uh, uh, that are uh, dissolved. Um, however, we don't uh, find this intermediate and we don't generate any in one phase. So we need to put some chelating agents in order to solubilize uh, the metals. And in this way, we increase the the concentration of metal ions in solution. And when we analyze this uh, liquid phase and the first hours of the hydrothermal synthesis, we observe that we have for the, uh, the intermediate. And indeed, what we see is that by tuning the amount of chelating agents, we can control the concentration of this intermediate. And if we can control the concentration of the intermediate, we can we have the opportunity to control the kinetics of crystallization. So this takes us to our new method. By tuning this, uh, these parameters, we have achieved a direct crystallization of M1 under hydrothermal conditions, uh, which is uh, a temperature between 150 and 200 degrees. Um, here I show you the crystalline composition of solids extracted from the outer plate at different synthesis times. Um, we started with mostly 80% uh, molybdenum dioxide and almost 20% of vanadium pentoxide. The trion and iodine oxides are in very small concentrations. Um, but you can see that after only four hours, already 60% of the crystalline material is M1. And then by uh, 15 hours, all the solids are uh, crystalline M1. Um, the material uh, prepared in this way have a higher surface area of meters, um, but I also have to mention that it has about 20% amorphous uh, that is not possible to fully crystallize uh, at this uh, condition. However, an 80% co uh, content in M1 and uh, high surface area are very promising. So of course, we tested the activity of this uh, material and here it is compared the M1 uh, crystallized at low temperatures versus M1 crystallized at high temperatures by the standard synthesis method, and you see here the rates are uh, normalized, the M1 content, um, and, and we have increased significantly the rates. Um, one can think that, of course, we have increased the surface area quite a lot, and that could be uh, the main reason. If we normalize the surface area, we still see that um, we have a higher activity in the low, low temperature crystallized M1, and if we normalize by both surface area and M1 content, we can 
detail that it seems that the intrinsic activity of our um, material prepared by the new method is, is higher than uh, N1 particles crystallized at high temperature. Um, in general, the lines, the Arrhenius plots are relatively parallel and similar energy activation, so we, we can uh, say that uh, our synthesis method has not changed the nature of the active size or the um, catalytic uh, mechanism, but we have a higher concentration of active size in the AM1 particles. Um, then if we look to the materials prepared by the new, uh, the new method uh, with the uh, STM, then it is we find always this morphology with a very um, corrugated lateral termination and then as soon as we saw these particles it was uh, clear to us why this intrinsic activity is a bit higher because in this type of corrugated terminal, uh, lateral termination we almost don't find any extended 0, 1, 0 inactive, um, inactive uh, facets um, therefore we have successfully uh, avoid as much as possible uh, this 0, 1, 0 um, this um, was all um, yeah. good result, but of course then the question comes, this material has been prepared uh, at relatively low temperatures, would it uh, uh, be stable under reaction conditions? So first of all, the crystallization happened at 200 or below 200 degrees, so we wanted to see if by heating up the material to the reaction conditions it would change. Uh, so we have uh, done most of the characterization also on the material precondition at 400 degrees. And uh, here you can see that the surface area increased a little bit, but uh, um, the crystalline composition was not affected by, by the treatment. And then uh, here on the right I show you um, a catalytic test um, uh, performed by our industrial partner, Claria, uh, in the mini pilot plant on the industrial like uh, ODH conditions and here we can see that uh, we have a certain deactivation in the first um, 30 days of reaction then uh, the catalyst achieved um, stable performance. And then well this is where we are and uh, now the question is if we can increase uh, further the intrinsic activity. Um, we think we've seen that in the fifteen first hours of synthesis we already per, uh, form all the end one. Then the question comes if the uh, crystallinity and the morphology of the particles changes during those first hours and if we might uh, manage to, to, to make even more uh, active uh, particles at shorter synthesis times. So these are uh, solids prepared at very uh, short synthesis times. Uh, here uh, we compare the, the thin formation plate normalized per, per M1 and surface area. All the catalysts uh, perform more or less, so the ethylene uh, selectivity to ethane conversion falls in the same line. Uh, so behaves the same, but we have a different concentration of active sites, and it seems that we have a maximum around uh, four hours um, of synthesis. Um, But uh, if we look at the, S, uh, at the STM images here, what we see is that <coughs> for synthesis time, like the 3.5 hours uh, sample, we have uh, we see particles with uh, still quite disordered parts. While if uh, we look at the 48 hours uh, samples, we see that we still have this, of course, corrugation that we have achieved by the low temperature crystallization. But we see that the particles we might even have some intergrowth between. Particles. So we think this uh, maximum of activity uh, that we have observed here might be a sweet spot between, uh, so we are compromised that we have enough long range order, enough uh, M1 crystal information, but uh, we have also avoided the uh, crystal growth or uh, healing of these of the material. Um, we would like to end here. Um, we have seen in the first part uh, that um, 
with the help of environmental STM and theory, we can understand better the promoting effect of tellurium. And we have gained understanding about how oxygen access species can be generated. Um, so we can think now to, to tune the semiconductor uh, properties of M1 with different promoters in, uh, in order to, to, to generate a catalyst that uh, can um, uh, change the reaction conditions. And uh, in the second part, we have seen that it's possible to increase the intrinsic activity of the material by uh, uh, controlling the location of active sites. Um, we can think now, uh, since we can control the crystallization under hydrothermal conditions, we can um, further optimize the morphologies. Um, well, and this is uh, also an, an approach that it might be interesting to, to also apply for other metal oxide patterns. Um, with all this, just uh, finally to, to acknowledge the, the work of uh, the students at the Technical University of Munich, our uh, industrial partners in Parian, uh, the beautiful electron microscopy images were uh, done by Joan Jansu of the PNNL, uh, Johannes Erke, which is the, the, the PI of the, of the project, and the funding from the Bavarian government the alliance between Karen and Munich. Thank you all for your nice. Thank you very much. Questions? What, what is the physical strength of the material, your catalyst, after you, uh, with your synthesis method, and have you looked at uh, using any kind of supports for this catalyst? Um, it has been tried. Um, I think you need you need at least several several unit cells to to generate the activity. So just supporting the uh, structures of, of, uh, of some of the building blocks of the M1 does not achieve the same the same activity. There's been some uh, I think some uh, works uh, supporting the cerium oxide that may a little bit more interesting results, but in general supported the uh, materials have been worked. Thanks for the comprehensive study. Really, it's very important. Uh, my question is related to the uh, selectivity, mainly CO2 and oxygenate. Mm -hmm. so these are critical factors for uh, yes. the industrial application. I mean, uh, you didn't show any data where you know, you showed the high activity catalyst if it makes less oxygenate mm -hmm. or makes uh, less CO2? The selectivity is uh, unfortunately a little bit worse than in the standard um, material because our rates are higher, the, same, the overall yield ethylene is much higher, but uh, we also have um, more CO2 with, with this new method. I don't know if you're asking in general uh, what about the oxygen? I mean, but in, from the industrial point of view, when uh, you remove oxygen from methylene, mm -hmm. you use for methylene, it's very costly. So you make more oxygen, that comes with a lot of money, it's crazy. Oxygen, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah like this is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, uh, in this case, I've been showing uh, results in, in dry conditions, but in the reactor, because you have. And you generate water, and you have uh, yeah. the presence of the steam. Then uh, it's true that the, that's another topic. I mean, I've been very focused on the, on the material, but it's uh, one of the main uh, problems is to, to uh, avoid this formation of acidic acid and other oxidants. Well, my question is related to that, actually. Um, you talked about steam, but obviously, you're making steam in the reaction during the oxidation dehydrogenation. To what extent are the structural changes that you see? Can they be induced by steam? Mm -hmm. uh, the changes under the steam are uh, to be uh, stronger. So this we have not done, but uh, this are, uh, there are publications of, uh, in the Fritz Haller Institute uh, under steam conditions. The changes they see, for instance, by XPS on the surface are more pronounced than the dry conditions. In this environmental STM, of course, uh, we would like to uh, introduce water as well, but at the moment, the, the results we have is 
slowly on the dry conditions, and then a little water that we are generated by the reaction significant. But we cannot tell. Uh, for, for the next time. Thank you so much. Um, my question is, uh, you were talking about you were using different gas mixture like hit and Q box different ratios and these different activities. I was just wondering how does that relate to relate, how does that really relate to what you were talking about the generation of the oxygen radicals? Uh, I think you were talking about that, right? Is mm -hmm. that about the generation of the oxygen Yeah, the like species. I thought you were <laughs> I maybe not even wrong, but I thought you were using different um, oxygen ratios. Yes, to yes, generate, yes. Like so what we did, uh, um, for instance, in this uh, in situ activation, yep. uh, where I show the response of different oxygen to ethane rating, we kept the partial pressure of ethane constant. But the reaction is, uh, is uh, the reaction order with respect to ethane is, is one, approximately one, and it's zero for oxygen. So in principle, if we change the concentration of oxygen, it should not matter. We kept the the partial pressure of ethane constant, and then we the oxygen content. How um, about that related, related to your generation of oxygen radicals you were talking about? So these changes that we see, we think is because, um, well, by changing the oxygen to ethane radio, you're changing the redox potential of the gas phase. And the, materi the material is a semiconductor that reacts to that. So, yeah. I don't know if I have <laughs> Yeah, but, but you're talking about oxygen generating from the lattice or your no, own? No, 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 no. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I mean, you <coughs> extract oxygen from the lattice and then you replenish it from the okay. gas phase. So okay. 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 Thank you for the nice talk. Um, I have a quick question. When you alter the hydrothermal synthesis method and uh, you manage to expose different facets of the lattice, I was wondering about the side effects of first creating those step sites with highly uncoordinated ions. And also, so I was wondering if the activity is related to creation of those steps, and also, mm -hmm. do you know what happened with the segregation, segregation of the cations with the new method? In other words, do you think maybe you expose something different at the very top layer of your catalyst by changing the, the synthesis method? Um, so, of course, this corrugate determination, uh, it could be more active because it has more defects. So what we know is that if we have these uh, very flat surfaces that are uh, the zero one zero facet, we can be quite confident that these um, surfaces are inactive. The reason is more active, we are exposing more of these um, crystalline positions that we think is the active side, or we have more defects. So it is both. Um, we are also exposing more of these half heptagonal um, um, channels, so no, we cannot rule out any of the effects. Um, regarding the other question, you are meaning like um, surface composition because of the different um, cations uh, that, that we have? Sorry, I was wondering if there is different segregation at the red layer. So the cation is exposed at the layer. Of the yes, so and you mean in a metal occupancy of the, the, it changes, because we have the, the crystal imposition, so we can see quite well what's the crystal imposition that is exposed. Whether this crystal imposition is more occupied by vanadium or molybdenum, this is at the moment not possible to say. But the metal stichiometry of these two catalysts that I compare is exactly the same. So I would, statistically, I would not expect to have very different occupancy. So next time once again, Mary Cruz. Thank you, Mary Cruz.